Welcome to Rich Thoughts TV. I'm Harold Herring, and that's my fine wife, Beth. Coming at you. Coming at you tonight with a word from the word. Amen. I love that. It was early morning when the Lord began giving me a rapid fire succession of seven things that, well, call it what it is, seven worst things a person could do. Now, honey, you know, you and I always try to be positive. That's right. As a matter of fact, when we take aspirin, they feel better. That's it. <laughs> but there are some things that we just don't need to do. I knew in due season he would help me put meat on the bones he was giving me to pass along to you guys. And here it is. Number one, not believing. There's an old saying, if you don't believe in something, you'll fall for anything. That's it. More properly said, if you don't believe in the Word of God, then you're more likely to fall for the tricks, traps, lies, deception, and wiles of the well, that the enemy is going to throw you away. Mm. The word believe is found in 131 verses in the King James Bible. But we feel that to share with you seven things that you must believe. First, you must believe God is a miracle working Savior. Amen. Matthew 9, 28. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him and saith, Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. Mm. And they said, unto him, Yea, Lord. Second, he wants you and your family saved. Thank you, Jesus. Acts 16, 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. Third, don't be afraid. Just believe. Mark 5, 36. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid. Only believe. Fourth, you must believe all things are possible for you. Mark 9, 23 says this. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Powerful scripture. Fifth, you must believe and not doubt. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Love this one too. Yes. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Maybe you don't have a mountain that's a physical mountain. Maybe you have a mountain of debt. Speak to your mountains. Sixth, you will receive what you believe. In Mark eleven twenty four, 24, in the New Living Translation, it says it this way. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Obviously, it has to line up with the word of God. Seventh, when you believe, you will receive power. John 1, 12, John 1, 12, classic amplified said, but to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority, power, privilege, right to become the children of God. That is to those who believe in, adhere to, and trust in, and rely on his name. Number two. Power. That's good stuff. Isn't it? it is. Number two, not doing. You know what impresses God? What makes a difference with Him? Romans 2.13, 2.13, Message Bible. Merely hearing God's law is a waste of your time. If you don't do what He commands, doing, not hearing, that's what makes a difference with God. That is just plain, plain, plain black and white. Hallelujah. God is impressed by what we actually do, not what we intended to do. Mm -hmm. Or say you we're going to do. That's true. And don't do it. You want God's approval? James 2.24. 2.24, God's word translation. Mm -hmm. You see that a person receives God's approval because of what he does, not only because what he believes. 
We receive God's approval by doing what he says in his word. Amen. Do you want to move from the prison of mediocrity to the freedom that success can bring? Then do something instead of just talking about it. Genesis 39, 22. 39, 22. And the keeper of the prison committed Joseph to Joseph's hand. All the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did, he was the doer of Love it. You know, according to Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew word doer is H6213. And it means this, to do, accomplish, produce. Joseph was a dreamer. But his destiny manifested because of what he did. Yes. He may have dreamed of ruling and reigning, but he had to make it happen by being faithful to God. You know, if we become known as a go-to person in the workplace, I promise you doors of opportunity will open. There'll be people calling you all the time, opening beyond your expectation. Joseph was a doer in prison and it opened the doors of the prison for him to escape into his destiny. Yes. When we listen, obey, and act on the word, you know, I could preach that about opening the doors of the prison because sometimes you get in a situation and you think, I hate this job. I'm just, gonna, you know, I'm just going along to get along. That will never open an opportunity nope, for you. Will not. But when you start doing above and beyond, watch out. God will be chasing you down with blessings. Anyway, when you listen, obey, and act on the word, God is going to bless you and reward you. James 1.25, New Living Translation says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Be a doer of the word. Yes. Mm. Number three, not confessing. There's a powerful reason why confession is good for the soul. It's more than just an old saying. Yes. It is a spiritual truth, a scriptural directive. Yes. That when you're walking with God, that's what happens. If we do not confess our sins and ask God for his forgiveness, then we're in deep trouble now and for eternity. Wow. John 1, 9, 1, 9. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. From all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. We confess our sins. He will forgive us. Scripture says all our unrighteousness. In order to be unrighteous, you first had to be righteous. So that all is necessary for God to forgive us is the confession of our sins. 1 John 1, 9. 1 John 1, 9. Amplified Bible. Yeah. gives It gives it an amplified look at what we just read. If we freely admit that we've sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just, true to his own nature and promises, and he will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us mm. from all unrighteousness, everything not in conformity to his will and purpose, thought, and action. When it comes to confessing our sins, Sometimes we might have to be like Fonzie from the old TV show, Happy Days. Can't go back that far. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> Keep going, baby. Fonzie could never admit that he made a mistake or even say the word sorry. He just couldn't seem to get those words out of his mouth. Sadly, hear me now. Some Christians have difficulty confessing their sins because they refuse to take responsibility for their actions. If you blame someone else for your problems, then you're, you're going to never become what God intends for you to become. Mm, think on that. Number four, not expecting. From the moment you open your eyes in the morning, you need to begin really expecting the supernatural power of God to live in you big and bold all through the day. I mean, Absolutely. he wants us to be that way. Psalm 5.3, New International Version says this. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. Thank you, Lord. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait in expectation. Psalm 62.5, 
My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Who are we looking to? We looking to our boss, to our spouse, or are we looking to God? I begin, you know, well, we begin really each day filled. We have to pump each other up sometimes with supernatural expectation about the manifestation of God's presence, his peace, his protection, his promises, his power, his promotion, and his provision. We listen to music sometimes just, boy, I wouldn't even have to get in the car to drive to work. I'm That's so it. pumped up. Pumped anyway, up. but child of God, look, if you begin your day with supernatural expectations, you won't be disappointed. Music does help you. Jeremiah 29, 13. 29, 13 in the Message Bible says, when you come looking for me, you'll find me. Wow, I love that. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. God's decree, I'll turn things around for you. You can count on it. That is what you call being expectant and basing it on the word of God. Hallelujah. Mm, pumps me up. <laughs> Number five, not loving. There are three people you need to love. First is God. If I were to ask you if you love God, your immediate answer would probably be, absolutely, with my whole heart. But the real question is not whether or not, well, whether or not God would say that you love him wow. with your whole heart. God uses a very simple test to determine the extent to which we love him. Mm. John 14, 15. Think on, listen to this. This is so crucial. John 14, 15, classic amplifier. If you really love me, you will keep, obey my commands. Wow. John 14, 23. 14, 23, classic amplifier. Jesus answered, if a person really loves me, he will keep my word, obey my teaching, and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home, abode, dwelling, special dwelling place with him. Hallelujah. God's criteria mm. for whether or not we love him with our whole hearts is based on whether or not we obey his instructions. Number two, love yourself. It has been said by some that if you don't love yourself, nobody else will. Now, while I could debate the spiritual implications of that statement, I do think it's important to love yourself. That's right. Specifically, who you are in Him, glorifying in why you were created in His image and after His likeness. Now, we can give you seven reasons why you should love yourself, and they're all tied to the third person that you should love. Third person, everybody else. I frankly ask people how God should have, why he should have to tell us something in order for us to get it and live it. The answer is how many times? Once. So if God tells you something at least six times, he definitely wants to make sure that you get it and you live it. Matthew 19, 19, classic Amplified. I learn your father and your mother and you shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. Matthew 22, 39. 22, 39, classic amplifier. Second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. Mark 12, 31. 12, 31, classic amplifier. The second is like it and is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Mm. Romans 13.9, 13.9, classic amplifier. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any and other commandment. That's right. They're summed up in a single command. You shall love your neighbor <coughs> as you do yourself. Galatians 5.14 goes on, classic amplifier. For the whole law concerning human relationships is compiled with this one precept. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. I mean, are we getting this point? But we're going to get down to the real point. If indeed, it says in James 2.8, 2, 8, Classic Amplified, if you indeed 
you really fulfill the royal law in accordance with the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. You will do well. The bottom line is this. You can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. That's because right. it says you love your neighbor as you do yourself. And there are a lot of people who do love their neighbor the way they love themselves, which is not very well because they don't love themselves. You need to know who you are in Christ, be accepted as to who you are in Christ, and it will give you a whole new outlook on life. Number six. You know, one other thing about that. Yes. People say that uh, joy, that you love Jesus, mm -hmm. others, and you. Now, that sounds nice, but it's not what the Word says. The Word says Jesus, you, and others. Because if you don't love you, that's right. You can't love anybody else. That's the truth. Think about that. And think about that in relationships that you see. Number six, not giving. <coughs> you know, this is a great time of year to talk about this, but it should be every time of the year because we could simply, you know, look at the bottom line of every, anytime it talks about seed time and harvest and tithes and offerings and see if there's a little asterisk that says, well, that's not for you. You know what? There is none. It's for everybody that calls himself a born again believer. Uh, really, it should be settled once and for all, even for people who make excuses about why, well, they don't think that they should give. But you can't plant a seed, uh, you can't go, uh, I should put it this way, you can't expect a harvest if you've never planted a seed. <laughs> Farmers don't go out and just go, be plant, you know, be planted out there. I'm expecting, you know, I don't have to have any seed. Be planted, I'm going to expect a harvest. That's not the way it works. And people a lot of times give excuses. They go, well, I don't have anything to give. Listen, everybody has something to give. And Ecclesiastes 11.4 in the Living Bible says it extremely well. It says, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. That's the truth. If you wait until you think you've got enough, then you know what? It'll never happen. And we hear, boy, being in ministry as long as we have, we hear every kind of excuse, every well-meaning, good-intentioned words that people feel as though this is the truth, but it does not line up with the word of God. And it's not going to, it's not going to benefit you unless you're lining yourself up. You can rationalize all you want, but if unless you align yourself up with the word of God, I can promise you, you don't need to expect much. So how can we be so sure that all these good folks, you know, are not going to pay off the mortgage of the church or make sure that things happen in the church or play, you know, giving to their favorite ministry? Because if you don't obey the word, it's not going to happen. Luke 16, 10 says this, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If you can't give a dollar in the offering plate because you don't think you've got it, you'll never give anything more and you won't really reap a whole lot more. The New Living Translation of Luke 16, 10 says it this way. If you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you know, God says to give tithes and gives offerings. If you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibility. If you don't sow what you've got right now, you will never sow later on. That's so true. It's just the, the long and the short of it. Number seven, not moving out of your comfort zone. Your comfort zone is an enemy of your future. That's right. A hindrance to your success and a stumbling block to your destiny. If you stay in your comfort zone, you'll never leave or surpass your current reality. Here are seven ways to get out of your comfort zone. Number one, realize why you are where you are. Mm -hmm. If you're working the same job in the same position that you were 10 years ago, you're still paying off the same debts. It's time for some self-examination mm -hmm. on your part. A man named Max Dupree, great business leader, once said, we cannot become what we want to be by remaining what we are. That is such a Let me good say that quote. Again. We cannot become what we want to be by remaining what we are. Listen, you are where you are 
because that's where you want to be. And what you've done in the past or what you do today, you reap tomorrow. So, so the question is, that's it. is it fear? Is it a desire to be comfortable in your surroundings and in the things that you do on a daily basis? Mm. Number two, let go of what's holding you back. That's it. If you don't face the fears, they'll keep growing. If you don't face your what you perceive to be your inaccuracies, they'll be magnified. If you're wondering what people think, it will you what people think if you if you fail in your new endeavor. See, you, you're wrong. You're worried about the wrong person. That's right. You need to be more concerned about what God thinks. Amen. Than anybody else in your circle. Mm -mm. Number three, try something new. You know, it's time to forget sometimes the way that we did things like they've always been done. Or maybe, I don't know, if you if you limit your future because of your past, you feel like, well, I've done, I tried that before. A lot of people try things and fail, but then they have to get up and keep going and try something new or try something again or try something with the new knowledge that they just gained. Um, that... Isaiah 43, 19 says this. This is in the New Living Translation. It says, for I'm about to do something new. God wants to do something new in your life every day. I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Are we expecting God to create rivers in the wilderness we may be going through or create rivers in the wasteland that we feel like we're in? He can do new things as long as we're staying where we're supposed to be, meaning right where he's guiding us. A ship in a harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Wow, that's good. So true. Number four, good habits will move you up and out. Bad habits will bring you down. So what is a habit? It's simply something that you've been doing so often that it becomes easy. In other words, it's a behavior you just keep repeating. So negative habits can, well, produce negative behavior. How do we change that in from negative to positive? Well, we have to consider the fact and ponder what we've been doing. What do we need to eliminate and what do we need to replace it with? It's kind of like renovating a home. That's you good. take out the bad stuff and you put in the good stuff. If you have bad wiring, you take out the bad wiring that's not making a connection. And you put in good wiring. It's called connecting with the Word of God. Really. So you just decide what is it that you need to do and then just take one at a time and start eliminating the bad and making a good thing of what you want to have happen. In Job 22, 26, Classic Amplified, it says, You shall also decide and decree a thing and it shall be established for you, and the light of God's favor shall shine upon your ways. You know what that's really saying? That's saying that God wants you to succeed, but you have to decide to take that step, and then he'll give you the motivation and the energy, and the Holy Spirit will help you get that negative out and put the positive in. Hallelujah. Amen. Number five, maybe you need somebody different in your foxhole. There you go. If you want to break out from your comfort zone, you may need to break free from some of the people that you've been hanging around with. Now, make no mistake, your attitude, your speech, and your behavior are directly affected by your friends. That's it. If they are comfortable in their comfort zone, then they're not going to do anything to move you out of yours. Mm -hmm. Do your friends encourage or discourage? Do they ignore your dreams, hopes, and plans for the future? Job 12.4, 12, 12.4, 12, New Living Translation. Yet my friends laugh at me. For I'll call on God and expect an answer. I am just and a blameless man. Yet they laugh at me. Listen, make no mistakes. No make no mistake about this. If your friends are laughing at those who are more out of life or with, who are happy where they are, mm -hmm. you can be certain they'll never do anything to help you break free from your comfort zone. Never. So true. Number six, travel from stupidity, bypass ignorance, and arrive at wisdom. 
there's actually the, those words are used in the Bible. You know, if you're living in your comfort zone because you don't know something or you're not willing to get out there and look into it. But I can tell you, if you're reading the word every day, you're going to find stuff. In Romans 1 it says, now I would have you not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes I purposed to come to you, but was led hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. According to Strong's word, a uh, strong concordance, that word ignorance is called not knowing. You know, ignorance is just not knowing something. You just don't know the facts. But unfortunately, stupid is knowing the facts and then choosing to ignore them and not do anything about them to make your life and your situation better. That is like my husband likes to say, dumber than cat hair and ignorance gone to seed. But anyway, the cure for ignorance is get knowledge. And that's exactly what the Lord wants us to do. Because he says in Psalm 119, 66, this in the New Living Translation, I believe in your commands. Now teach me good judgment and knowledge. There are so many times we could quote time after time after time, truthfully, on that. Anyway, seven, keep yourself motivated during your comfort zone exodus. What it would take to keep you motivated as you move from mediocrity to success? From just getting by to having more than enough. Mm. From average to excellence. From your comfort zone to sitting on the throne of your kingdom. Yes. A successful person is always blessed and motivated. By the word of God. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, one other key is to turn the radio off and your imagination off. Yeah. Read the word. Forget talk radio. Now, you know, I, as you may know, I like politics. But it's time to put your money towards your bills instead of somebody else's. Forget sports radio. I know your team played last night, but it's time to do more about the kingdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Your future is in front of you. That's right. But it'll never, you'll never discover it in your comfort zone. Think about that. That's it. Hallelujah. Join us next time. And keep thinking rich thoughts from the Word of God. Amen.